Out! Out, unclean thing! The power of Christ compels you! The power of Christ compels you! That's a story. You really are too much. Then what happened? <laughs> Conquered the forces of darkness. <laughs> it's been ages since I've seen you, Malcolm. No. As I'm sure you're well aware, there is power. Is power in there. For now, for this appearance, I ask that you and the audience call me Father Delaney. You could say. I'm traveling incognito, and an alias is necessary. Yes, for each of us there is a name, a name that reveals the nature of the beast. You could even call us Asian, for we are many. Tonight, I will share with you stories of possession. Oh, really? What fun. May I? Oh, by all means, old friend. Dark in the room, Spooky Rosie's children of rot, and we shall commence. Although I'm glad to see you back in circulation, what made you take up residence in a priest? From the Vatican, no less. Well, Spooky, what better way to foil the powers of good than by performing phony exorcisms, allowing a demon to continue his residency? And as a glutton for impropriety, you surely heard the recent stories tarnishing the already questionable reputation of the Catholic Church. Yes, but not even I enjoy those. <laughs> You didn't have anything to do with that, did you? I should say not. I may be a demon, but I do have some principles. I've been collecting the souls of these, uh, these... Uh, how, how should I s Perverts! <laughs> right. Collecting them for my magistrate, the Prince of Darkness, Satan. You've been to hell? Of course. So then, you know with all these millennials, running out of room. But still, Satan in all his wisdom has managed to create a new wing for these morally reprehensible degenerate priests. It's really quite something. You see, in the lowest pits, they have created a mechanism that, once attached, will for all eternity shred their- Father Delaney, I believe you were here to discuss other gruesome details. Those pertaining to possession. Ah, yes. As I'm sure you gathered, I'm quite an authority on the subject. One of my favorite cases is seldom mentioned today. From Iowa, of all places. The victim was given the pseudonym Anna Eklund, but her real name was Emma Schmidt. Unseen hands prevented her from entering churches. She presented morbid fascinations, and by the age of 12, she had already suffered the agony of an exorcism. Yes, however, it was unsuccessful. Was this your work? No, it seems the child was selected by Mina, her maternal aunt and father's mistress, to serve as an earthly vessel for all manner of demon. Mina was a powerful black witch. She realized that should the child become possessed again, those returning demons would owe her a great debt. They would perform whatever task she asked so she set about hexing the child, soaking herbs and potions in the food she prepared for her. If I recall correctly, this was far from the only child she had harmed. Correct. She killed four of her own as sacrifice. Did any of her witchery serve her well? <laughs> no. She too died. 
However, the black magic of its seventh motion in my age 26 to me had to become fully possessed. Father Theophilus, the priest who performed the first exorcism, suspected this and encouraged her to undergo another. The first prayer, it was evident he was correct. If I'm not mistaken, in the month-long exorcism that followed, Emil crawled up walls, physically transformed, levitated above her bed, spoke languages she did not know, and berated the nuns and priests aiding in her exorcism with embarrassing secrets they kept to themselves. Secrets only they would know. Why, she even predicted an attending priest's brush with death and a near-fatal car crash. As for Mina, she wasn't quite dead at all, as she too presented herself as a spirit that possessed the young lady. But you're missing the best part. This case is the only known case of possession, in which the exorcist suffered a terrifying vision brought on by the visiting demons. In the final moments of the last exorcism, the Lucifer himself materialized. The enraged deity appeared within the corner, his foot scratching at the floor, and atop his horn had a golden crown. In the opposite corner, he had brought his trusted associate, Beelzebub. Though Beelzebub remained silent, Lucifer spoke of the impending final day, and that soon the Antichrist would reign supreme. I'll drink to that. <laughs> here, here. The forces at hand explained that though they were leaving now, they would indeed be back again with a vengeance. The case is indeed troubling. But what beyond the book based on the case would serve as proof? Well, if that evidence isn't compelling enough, there is the case of Michael Taylor. You can't say that one isn't true. And why not? It has a body count. Well, I suppose that is hard to argue with. <laughs> yes, the strange case of Michael Taylor began in the town of Osset in the United Kingdom. Mr. Taylor was once a devoutly religious man. So were you. <laughs> <laughs> it seems the trouble began when Mr. Taylor joined a church fellowship with a friend of his family. There he became transfixed on the group's leader, Miss Marie Robinson. He was so enamored with the 21-year-old that his wife confronted him one morning during church. She accused him of having an affair in front of their fellow church members. It was then that a disquieting metamorphosis overcame the 31 year old family. Onlookers watched in horror as his face was said to become that of an animal. His lips drew back and his eyes turned a shade of red. He lunged for his wife, but was soon apprehended by his fellow parishioners. It was at this moment Taylor and those who touched him began speaking in tongues and having seizing fits. Ah yes, I recall this case. From then on Taylor continued to devolve. His outbursts and strange behavior soon caught the attention of the local vicar, who insisted an exorcism was necessary. At the stroke of midnight, October 5th, 1974, Taylor was strapped to the floor of the local monastery. In the exorcism that followed, 40 demons presented themselves. Those that were the masters of heresy, <laughs> insanity, blasphemy, and carnal knowledge. <laughs> one by one, they were dragged out. But by 8 a.m., the priests were defeated and insisted that the exorcism would be finished at a later date. No sense of urgency, I suppose. The minister's wife, present for the exorcism, insisted that they not stop. As she claimed... The voice of God told her the demon of murder was still attached to Taylor, and that danger was soon to follow. The ministers dismissed her claims as they believed they knew best. They sent Taylor and his wife home, telling them to prepare for the exorcism that was to continue the following evening. A mere two hours passed, and upon entering the family kitchen, Mr. Taylor proceeded to tear his wife apart, gouging out her eyes, ripping out her tongue, and peeling away bits of her face with his bare hands. 
covered in her blood, he took to the streets screaming, This is the blood of Satan. Taylor was arrested, and during his trial it was revealed the church leader, Ms. Robinson, led a sort of cult under the guise of a church. He was found not guilty by reasons of insanity, and committed to insanity. Oh, knock, knock! Mr. Spooky, I, I, I noticed, oh, I noticed the last time I pumped your stomach, you had eaten some of Devive's crematory cookies. She just whipped up another batch, and I thought you would like some more. <laughs> Your god, the Bobo Clown, said you were back here. Damn you, Bobo! Oh, who have we here? Oh, oh, a, a priest! Stand back, Mr. Spooky. You won't be harassing my number one customer! <laughs> Though this sudden outburst of irrational violence is touching, that won't be necessary. This is my friend Mallory. <coughs> Father Delaney. A very old friend of mine. He's merely possessing Father Delaney to further our agenda. Scheiße. Das ist Blotzen. Possession is simply the combination of silly religious superstitions and unchecked mental illness. You, my heir, are full of lies. Um, I am a demon, so that's kind of our thing. Ha! See, he admits it. Well, take for instance the case of Annalise Michelle. That poor sink didn't stand a chance. She was from my home country of Deutschland. In 1975, at only 16, she suffered a seizure leading to a diagnosis of temporal lobe epilepsy. Yeah, she saw faces of devils while praying and heard them whispering to her. But these were only hallucinations brought on by schizophrenia. Modern medicine cannot explain away the supernatural. Try as you may. I assure you, the fool's name. So you say. Well, with Tesla as my witness, I am that fool. Possession. Bah! Well, when she was still just a teenager, she was committed to an asylum. Ugh. Boys, boys, this is silly. Why can't that we... may be something, but her condition worsened, despite being treated with medication. For five years, she was forced fed pills and underwent countless treatments, all to no avail. Her family soon realized the power of prayer and exorcism was necessary. It was that which killed her. Was it? Or was it the countless spirits that used her as a vessel? They all were there. Judas Iscariot, Lucifer, Cain, and slew Abel. Even the Emperor Nero. Oh, now hold on just a minute. I know most definitely that Nero was not there, as he and I just had a lunch date um, maybe two weeks ago. Ha ha ha. The autopsy report stated that the cause of death was dehydration and malnutrition. Not to mention her untreated broken knees from constant genuflecting and evidence of pneumonia. She starved herself to death, believing it would weaken the entities that existed only in her mind. The priests and her parents were found guilty of the neglect and sentenced to six months in prison. Ignorant people attributing this child's condition to the devil and not mental illness. Oh, mental illness. What mental illness would have allowed her to speak in languages she didn't know? And what mental illness would transform a girl in her 20s into this? <laughs> what mental illness would make a young lady sound and speak like this? Du riechst na pasta. Du wirst eine Krankheit, Mr. Brachen. 
Can't both of you try, try to be this. civil? Perhaps both of you are right. What you need is a mingling of unmitigated truth, along with the supernatural. Well, actually, Mr. Spooky, nothing of the supernatural can be uh, proven. <laughs> <laughs> As you were saying. Take, for instance, a case here from our own neck of the woods. In 2011, Latoya Amons, accompanied by her mother and two children, moved into 2860 Carolina Street in Gary, Indiana. The activity within the home began small. Footsteps could be heard late at night, pacing the basement stairs. Disembodied voices, with no explainable source, were soon to follow. Apparitions began appearing in the family's living room. Angry, looming figures, towering shadows that left clawed footprints on their carpet. A strange phenomenon plagued the home. The children, too, would suffer. After the children were seen discussing death with beings that bore no physical body, they began to act out. The daughter begged her grandmother to rescue her from the entities within the home explaining she could no longer stand them watching her every move. She was even found levitating one evening four feet above her bed. The youngest boy, well, he would growl uncontrollably, chanting in an old man's voice, I've been here long enough. Time to die. Time to die. This is where modern medicine comes in. Hospital staff and a CPS caseworker named Valerie Washington. April 23rd, 2012. The intake report reads, Later that evening, the child began to growl. He charged at his grandmother and headbutted her several times. The CPS manager, who later needed a therapist, testified to the police that she and the hospital psychologist witnessed the boy grab his grandmother's hands and walk backwards up the room's wall. Medical professionals were left speechless, unable to explain away what they had just witnessed. Police performed a wellness check one week later. As they toured the home, doors were seen opening and closing of their own fruition, and phantom voices could be heard whispering. All of this evidence culminated in the church agreeing to an exorcism, the first of many. Surprised? We do good work. Might I continue? Zach Bagans purchased the house, trying to capitalize on whatever entities were in the home. This backfired when his friends and fellow paranormal investigators, Mark and Debbie Constantino, attempted to aid in his investigation. The couple, after receiving a strange EVP communication from an entity they believed was from the Gary house, the two were found dead. This was from an apparent murder-suicide. Bagans, being the fool he is, continued his investigation. His cameras captured an unexplainable shadow-like entity hiding in the house's restroom. His cameraman, after leaving the home, began vomiting blood. A nervous breakdown was soon to follow. He told Bagans, Break the mirror in the bathroom. That's where it lives. Take the glass and slit your throat. He later explained, a figure he described as a goat man would not stop following. Bagans himself, after spending a night there, suffered permanent vision loss. <laughs> a condition that is untreatable. Ultimately, the home was torn down by Zach Bagans. He felt this place was a literal gateway to hell. I guess we're one less. And as for the Amons family, they've never been the same since. And spend their lives in hiding. Are they still possessed? Do they know more than they admit? Yes. I'm trying to end on a mysterious note here. Oh, but there is no mystery. They're definitely still possessed. There are possessed people everywhere. Did you know America's belief in the supernatural has gone up in the past decade? A poll conducted by an American analytic group in 1990 showed only 55% of the country believed in the devil, but as of 2007 it had left to 70%. Father Vincent Lampert, 
The Archdiocese of Indianapolis in 2018 received nearly 2,000 phone calls and emails begging for exorcisms. In 2011, there were fewer than 15 Catholic exorcists in America, but today there are more than 100. Well, what the hell is your point? Well, my point is this. When Lucifer was flung from heaven by the enemy, he did not fall alone. One third of heaven's angels joined him. I mean one of them. We've only grown in number since then. As America's faith in the supernatural grows, so too do we. Well, I suppose if the mind convinces itself that something is real, then who is to say otherwise? See? That's the spirit. Now that you two are getting along, why don't we make an item, hmm? I have reservations for one of my favorite night spots, the Coconut Grove. Oh, that club burned it down in 1942. <laughs> yes, and 492 people died. <coughs> and that was the one time they forgot to save me a booth. As the boys and I head out, just remember, as um, Father Delaney once said, the dark side is always there, waiting for us to enter, waiting to enter us. You could very easily be the next show's subject of interest. Only time can tell for certain, but if I were you, I would err on the side of caution. And as always, remember me as you scroll by. If you liked our show, then please subscribe. As we are now, so you must be. Prepare for death. And follow me. Oh, my God.